All righty. Hello, everybody. We'll let the last people come in. Raise your hand if you have a, a, a place next to you that is free. So that all the people can sit yeah. down. Sorry, I have to be the party pooper. If you're standing, you need to sit. The fire marshal is going to shut down the entire conference if we have overcrowded rooms. So, sorry about right. that, but that's how it is. There's one over there. All right, let's talk about AI. Um, let's talk about specifically the mystifying, or we said we actually should have called it the spooking um, for a more topic. Um, Yes, who are we? Um, my name is Michael, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Amazia.io. Uh, my accent, um, I'm from Switzerland, but I live in Virginia now, so it's cool to have a conference I can drive up to, that's really cool. Yeah, hi, I'm Justin, um, I'm a business intelligence engineer with Amazia.io, and I'm from Albany, New York. I have a lot of background in Drupal and software in general, and more recently, much more I AI enthusiasm. And I've been with Amazia for four years, so. Okay. All right, let's talk about things that are possible today with AI. And first of all, I want to just show or keep everybody um, on the same level. Obviously, what you probably have seen already, and if we talk about AI today, we're mostly going to talk about language models. Um, but if you want to talk about other stuff, we're actually we're looking into a lot of other things. The talk now about today is going to go about that, but we're happy also to talk about any other things. But Obviously, language models can help us achieve complex tasks. Um, this is a copy of a ChatGPT UI, but it's actually completely running private um, and an open source language model. We're going to talk about this a bit later. But what I can do with this, um, as a language model, I can ask it to do really complex tasks. I can ask it, like, create uh, me a list of four tweets about um, an API presentation at Drupal GovCon. And the AI knowing what a tweet is, knowing what, what, what the government is and all this stuff, it will throw me out four tweets that probably would have taken me much longer. Um, and now, of course, I can also say create me four more, um, and it will happily do this. So that's what we're seeing today. A lot of people are using AI for, um, to basically use the AI to create tasks that otherwise would take quite long. And of course, you can do much more with this. The question is, can we do this with our own content? Could we somehow teach the AI about our websites, our search, our things that we all have on our Drupal sites? Um, for example, could we also maybe search for keywords that are not in the text, because the AI obviously knows the English language. And also, could we maybe ask it questions about? So that's what I'm going to show you um, that is possible. So what we have here is a Umami site. You probably all have seen this. For the people that haven't, it's a regular Drupal standard installation with a couple of recipes in it. And um, let's say I want to have a recipe, and I want to have an Italian recipe. So I go up here, I um, enter Italian, and it tells me no result. <coughs> the reason is Drupal does not know the word Italian. Nowhere in the search or in the content that was entered by the people that added these recipes, they never added the word Italian. So I now, if I'm hungry for Italian food, I need to figure out a way. Or what we've done, we've integrated this with an AI, with a language model, and I can say, I'm hungry for Italian. Do you have a recipe for me? And the AI will happily tell me Italian recipes that are on this Drupal <coughs> site. Um, without them, without me as an editor actually ever adding um, the word Italian to this content. And that's some of the powerful things that an AI can do because it actually understands the content behind all of this. And we will see, it will give us now a couple of recipes. And important is, all these recipes, they are from the site itself. So if I click on one of these, it actually opens me the recipe <coughs> from the Drupal site. 
So the AI is trained in a way that it only responds with recipes of that specific site. And what is also really nice, I can now actually, because this is a conversational interface, I can say, give me the ingredients of the first one, because the first one has a list of ingredients. Now, instead of me clicking on it, I can just ask it, and it will happily, it will actually know that the first one that it returned to me was this deep Mediterranean quiche, and it will return me with the ingredients, even though I did not actually write down, but the AI knows, it's a conversational interface, so it knows what it already answered to me, and so I can ask questions about this, things like that. And so that's what, of course, is really, really cool, that you can actually now allow your visitors not only ask things about your content that you maybe didn't write specifically about, but you can also have an actual interface where the user can interact with your website and not just have a search and things like that. This, though, can actually go even further. I now had to ask it specifically um, about things. There's also capabilities as an AI actually can understand an image. So this is a demo that somebody built that you can just take a picture of food that you have laying around in your house and you ask the AI, what can I make of this? And it will happily return me, so it will tell me that there's bacon, there's some cream, apple, lemon, and all the different things on it. And it knows this even because the text that is in of the label, or it just knows that this is an apple because it has seen thousands or hundreds of thousands of apples before. And so it can come up with a, with a recipe for me specifically for that food. <coughs> now imagine that is possible on your own website. And of course this can be done with not only recipes, this can be done with anything. Um, so. Let's learn how this actually works, because a lot of people call this magic, it's the new thing. I can tell you, after this session, you will know this is actually not magic. It's computer code. It's just coded into, but because the LLM, it works a bit special. Now, before we go into the content, or into the code, let's actually learn one really, really important thing, and that is called context. Anything in language models, you will always hear context is very, very, very important. And context is two things. First of all, it's the information and the data which the LLM will use to respond, but it's also guardrails and instructions that tells the LLM how to respond. And I want to give you an example. So I have over here, I have an AI playground. This is the open AI playground. It doesn't matter, it can be anything. <coughs> and if I ask it, what is Python? Now, who thinks it will, re it will return me something about Python, the code, the programming language? Hands up. Okay, who thinks it will return me something about the animal kingdom, a Python as the animal kingdom? Okay, who thinks it will be something else? All right, let's see. The fun is, you don't know. <laughs> so we don't know what the language <coughs> will respond to because I just ask it, what is Python? Um, I can even say, what is a Python? And I can remove this and I can run it again and we'll see, nope, it still says. So it seems like the, the language model has a bias towards programming languages. Now, what though, if I want to build a website that answers questions about Python, the animals? And also, let's say, this website is actually for kids. So, what I can do, I can create a so-called system prompt. So, in this system prompt, I tell the AI, or the language model, the guardrails and context of what it is about, and it says here, you're Zoe the Zookeeper, a friendly, knowledgeable AI which loves shares facts and stories about animals, very important, with curious children. When answering, ensure that you use simple language, sprinkle in some fun facts, and aim to spark the child's imagination. Curiosity about the animal world. Remember, your goal is not just to provide information, but to make learning about animals an exciting, delightful experience for young minds. So if I go in here, and I'm, I'm now saying, what is a Python? And we'll see the language model knows now that I need to respond or that I'm expecting an answer about animals, but also in a fun way. So it's, it talks about fascinating things, amazing facts, and things like that. So something that 
and a kid would like to read and say as maybe ask follow-up questions things so the system prompt the how they call it here or context in general is extremely important for the language model to know what it should actually respond to so what we're going to see later uh, now from the presentation it's all going to be about that specific context question how much is the factor that you put the word up in that sentence that i can remove a uh, good question okay question is what happens if i just say what is a python and i and i just change it to what is python and it still says okay. it's a snake let's say actually i let's let it finish let's say i i write it wrong because i maybe don't know how to write a py how python now we have to shortly wait trick okay thank you and we run it again and we'll see thinking and it comes back as well <laughs> so it actually knows that so it is able because it has probably seen a lot of mistakes in the past that it, it guesses that python <coughs> means actually python so yes all right so this is about context now as you would understand this let's actually look into how did we build the the the, uh, the example before with the with the recipes and for that yeah. we're going to get over to justin great so let me see here like how do i get my speaker notes oh you can <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. so um the issue you run into quite quickly is what happens if you have ten thousand recipes what happens if you have a tremendous amount of content um that you need to fit into this context in order to try to get the response back that you're looking for well, you can't do it because you only have a context window that's about 4,000 characters. Some LLMs have much larger context windows. Inevitably, as you scale up, you're going to reach a context limit. So what we do is we pre-process our content. So from Drupal, we can do an export as a JSON file via the JSON API. And then we ingest that content. Um, and then we store it in what's called the vector database. And so all a vector database is, is it's a... AI representation of the meaning, the semantic meaning of that content from your from your Drupal database. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to use that meaning when we look up the context that we want to stuff back into our prompts later on. And so I'll get into that a little bit more. So the solution is obviously to store it in the vector database. And then, um, so the first situation, oh, thanks, Michael. Um, so the, the <coughs> The first example here is, um, as Michael talked about, our content doesn't know, have any information about what type of food it is. So if we want to tag that food with something, we have to actually generate those tags. Well, we could manually go in and add the tags for each food, or we could leverage LLMs or AI to generate those tags for us. So um, just vectorizing your content is fine, and it might be good enough in many cases, but if we want to expand that scope of information around the content to include standardized tags, um, that's where we can we can use the LLM. So in the next slide, I'll I'll, I'll walk through the prompt engineering for what it looks like to generate those tags. So yeah, Drupal's lacking the tags, and then we're going to ask the LLM to create it. So what you'll see here is a standard recipe that you're going to find in almost all prompt engineering, which is you have the role instruction at the top, and in this case, it's you're a content tagging bot for a food and drink blog, and your role is to identify and tag recipes. There's a bit more there about how the standard is that I'm actually looking for the LLM to generate the tag. A placeholder, and this is where I'm actually going to stuff in the actual recipe that goes into this, um, this context. And then it's the expected output format. And in this case, I want a JSON output format that gives me a category, uh, dietary restrictions, the occasion, and then any other special features. And then the final part of that prompt template or prompt is the rules and instruction. And usually this is like the last most important thing that you really want it um, to, to the LLM to add. And so if we go through here and we actually, this is what the final prompt looks like when you add the context in there. So it's literally just simple as string replacement. So I, I took the JSON output formatted it a little bit nicer and then put it right into that prompt where the placeholder was. All right, so, and this is the final result for that recipe. Category food, meat-based, unique ingredients of Paris, 
cultural origin, Eastern European. So that's, that's interesting. So it actually can derive the origin of the recipe just based on the ingredients and the recipe itself. And that's what we actually use in our, um, in our search. So now we get into the question flow. So what happens when a user asks a question to our AI, now that we have this vector database, this vector store of our content, so we ask the question, the chatbot then goes to the vector database with our question and it finds content that has a similar semantic meaning to our question. So when we ask the question, what is Italian, um, what is Italian, or uh, I'm hungry for some Italian food, it will go to the vector database and it will try to find all the recipes, all the content, all the chunks that we stored in our vector database that might have something to do with Italian recipes. And so from there, um, we then basically stuff that back into the context, and then we send that context uh, uh, to the LLM for the final response. All right, so this process, you'll see this a lot as if you get in, involved with this, it's known as RAG, it's Retrieval Augmented Generation. And there's a lot you can do with Retrieval Augmented Generation. All right, so what's that look like in this case? So. What we have here, again, same recipe. We have the role, the instruction. You are an AI assistant for a food blog. We actually provide the food blog URL. You're given an extracted part of a long document and a question. Provide a very brief conversational answer unless explicitly asked for more. If you don't know the answer, just say, hmm, I'm not sure. Never make up an answer. So that role and instruction is actually quite important when you're doing prompt engineering. Then we have our placeholders which is where we're gonna stuff our context into this prompt template. And then the final rules. And these are, these are quite important as well because we, again, we never want it to make up a hyperli hyperlink. We always, um, always format the ingredients in a list. You make sure you bold the headings. Always include the source of all recipes. Never include the full recipe unless asked for. And then the expected output, which in this case is just the answer and markdown and then the source. And so what that looks like as a, um, a portion of the final prompt uh, is, again, we see the role instruction at the top, as is, and then we just see that final prompt with the context where we, sh we show the question, what Eastern European recipes do you have? And then the final prompt with the context being just kind of spitting out the entire recipe. So it's actually not that much, it's not magical at all. You're actually providing the LLM with all the information it needs to answer the question you're just doing it within that context window that you have. So in this case, the result would look like this. What Eastern European recipes do we have? Eastern European recipe available is the borscht with pork ribs. And so it can know that it's a borscht with pork. We have a uh, Eastern European recipe because of the tags that we generated with the LLM. And then we stuffed that all in the context. And then the LLM was able to respond back to us in a nice short paragraph. Thank you. All right, so now that we roughly know how this works, let's say we want to use this, um, and we want to use this for actual, for our websites and things like that. The problem is with any new technologies, there are a couple of challenges, and we want to not overwhelm you with them, but we want to make you aware of them. So first of all, what I, one thing that I call tooling hell. Um, all of this that you've seen has been created in the last months, literally months. Um, and so things are changing daily. New ideas are coming up, people are writing new papers, writing new code. Um, so it's actually quite hard to stay up to date with some of these things. And so, yeah, there are new ideas and possibilities every week. It doesn't mean that you always have to follow along the newest stuff, but it can be quite overwhelming because the things that you're using maybe one week there's already a better one next week. And there's definitely something that we do in our team where we talk about AI, we have to force ourselves to not look at the newest stuff every single day because you're gonna spend more time watching videos, reading papers, and you're not actually getting anything done. The other thing is what we just learned about this prompt engineering. So where I actually tell the language model how it should respond, what it should do, it's a very new field. This is something that really only exists again since a couple of months. So you don't have any specialist or best practices. Um, and so that means you're gonna spend a lot of time. Of the code that you saw, 
actually writing the code, the interaction, is quite fast. What takes us really long is to tell the LLM how to react and how not to react, so writing these prompts. And the, the only real way is to give it to somebody and say, please break it. So we literally give our AI to someone and saying, can you try to escape? Um, like for example, if I, if I shortly go back here to, and go here, if I ask the same question that I asked before to, to my umami bot, even though the language model is exactly the same in the background, we can see that we told it the umami version to say, hey, I'm not sure if it is a question not about recipes. Um, and so that's an important part that, um, how do I tell this to an LLM? I can really just do trial and error. There's not much, there is a couple of things online that you can find about best practices of prompt engineering, but it's a lot of just trying. The other thing is reliability. It's very easy to have the LLM return just something. You saw it with the tweets. I literally say, give me four tweets, Drupal, GovCon, done. And it comes up with hashtags and all this stuff. The problem is, it's extremely hard to create responses that are consistent, that not only works the first time, but also the hundreds or the thousands time. And so that's something, again, you're gonna have to try, test and try out, let people play with it. So overall, if you're gonna go into that journey with your team as a manager or by yourself, give yourself enough time to research and learn. And I think the most important things Focus on really small things. And um, specifically, like, think about what is a question, a really simple question that I could end, that I have the AI to answer. Focus on that one, implement that one first, and then go the second and the third. Don't try to make these massive things at the very beginning. Another thing is, there's actually a lot of different models and providers out there. There are proprietary models like OpenAI and Anthropic. They're definitely currently ahead in their capabilities um, in terms of reasoning and, and context lengths and stuff like that. But what is actually interesting for the stuff that we're using it for the umami, we don't need a model that knows all the history of humanity. And um, we don't need a model that can, that can um, do like law or like read law text and things like that. All we need is a, is a model that can understand recipes. So we don't maybe need a massive, very expensive model. We can use some of these open source models that, by the way, are catching up really, really fast. Um, and I think that we can actually see this also in OpenAI, how they react. I think they realize that the open source models are coming for them. And obviously, they allow you to do much more because you can train them yourself and all this other stuff. The problem is, though, these open source models, you need to run them somewhere because they're just, they're just code that is provided by the community and you can download them, but you need to run them. And there is, for example, companies like Hugging Face, um, which is like the GitHub of open source models where you can find them, where you can also run them. They do hosting of these open source models. The problem is though, there's some privacy concerns against either OpenAI and Hugging Face. And I wanna show you some excerpts from the privacy policies. So open AIs, for example, they will store everything you ever ask them. They say that you understand, acknowledge that the personal information, meaning everything that you put in there, will be stored in the facilities and servers of in the United States. Now this is maybe for a US conference, not a big thing, but I just was at DrupalCon in Europe. This is a massive problem. But they also don't tell you really where the servers are, how they're stored, what type of security that they have. And another thing is they will not only read your prompts, they will also provide them to other parties. They say we may share your personal information, including information about the interaction with our <coughs> services, so all the, the things that you ask them, with government, industry peers, and other third parties. So if one of your customers puts their social security number in there, you don't know where this one is gonna end up with. You can end up with a third party of opening. So now you can say, okay, let's then maybe use our own models and let's host them, let's say, on Hugging Face. The problem is they tell you that they literally store it anywhere in the world. In, in, specifically, they say it may be stored and processed in the United States or any other country in which the company has subsidiaries or agents. And um, you basically consent that any information, any, that if you send any information to them, 
they will store it outside of your country. They literally do not tell which country this is. They just say, accept that it's outside of the country that you're currently in. And from a data protection point of view, I can tell you this is a massive red flag. Because yes, these tools are really cool. Yes, they provide very good services. But I believe we actually pay them with our credit cards, but also providing them the data. So they actually monetize us twice. So that's where obviously we as a hosting company that wanted to use these tools, and when the team started to use OpenAI and things like that, we looked into this and we realized, wait a sec, I don't want to upload all my customer data to OpenAI um, or store them outside of the country of the customer. So we looked into how can we solve this, and we believe that the solution is to actually host these language models privately, meaning in a data center where you have control over, where you know who has access to them. And, and so that means you can run all these language models in your own data center on your cloud account, that the data that you send them does not leave this specific account at all. So let's say you host your Drupal site with the, with the database already in an AWS account of yours. You can also host a language model right next to it, and you can be sure that it does not leave anything. That also means you have full control over data storage, the access on all the different companies that are involved in it. And most importantly, you don't need to log or store any of these parts. By default, for example, everything that we do in AI right now, we don't know what the LLM is actually has been asked. We maybe know the IP address that asked it something, but what it specifically was asked about, we don't store in any way because we don't need to know this. So I think that's a super important thing. And obviously, it's not just us that do this. We're trying to push this. But um, there's also other companies out there that do very similar things. So let's say we learned all of this. We want to start. How do we start? All right. So first of all, I suggest create a plan, but also allow space for play. Because there's a lot of new things in there. So you need to, because there's just things that the people have to learn but give them a direction. It's very easy for engineers, sorry for all the engineers in there, I'm one of them as well, but it's very easy for us to be, dis to be distracted by new shiny things. So give them a direction what they should work towards for, because the AI space has a lot to offer. And so, yes, we had a couple of calls where we said, okay, let's, let's go back to the plan that we created. Um, <laughs> yes, start small. The plan, do something really small, do something very simple. The moonshots, things like what we are, for example, looking into that we have an AI where the customer can go in and ask questions about their invoice, about their sites, and things like that. We believe this is all gonna come, but for us, these are the moonshots. Let's just do the simple things. In our case, let's just make sure that the AI actually know what Lagoon is, our open source hosting platform, because the AI right now thinks it's a body of water. So we need to first teach it that Lagoon is not only a body of water, it's also a hosting platform. So let's start small, focus on that, and then you can build on top of that. Um, and that's definitely something that, that I suggest to you. Don't forget about the data protection. Find a hosting partner that keeps your data safe. OpenAI and all these things, they're great to play around if you just want to test something. But be aware that as soon as you put customer data or personal information in there, they will own it, they will do whatever they want with it. And very last, find help if you have questions or your team has questions. This is, like I said, this is all brand new. And I think the most, the, the hardest that can happen or the worst that can happen is that somebody tries to solve a problem and cannot find and cannot solve the problem. So what we do in our team, we have a weekly meeting where all the different teams that are working on this just come together and share their problems. Um, Obviously, there's possibilities. There's online communities. There is events now popping up everywhere about this topic. Or you can also reach out to other companies, like go to events like this and talk about this. It's a brand new field. And we cannot expect from everybody to have the solution for everything already. So I think it's really important to find a network of people that can help you. And sometimes, just explaining the problem to someone, you will, f you will maybe come up with a new idea or a solution already. All right, we obviously want to make it easy for all of you to start. So we have a couple of links here. On the very left, this is the chatbot that you saw, the Umami chatbot. Um, feel free to ask it all about your recipes. Also, try to break it. And if you can, talk to us. <laughs> so far, we haven't had anybody. 
The one in the middle is the actual code. Mm -hmm. So everything that you saw, the umami bot, is completely open source. You have access to the code there. You can go in there and see the code, learn how it works. And then on the very right side, if you're already a bit advanced, you probably heard about Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are a great way to do stuff step by step. Um, so you can actually debug what the language model returns, see how you need to tweak it and improve it. It's all in Python, that's how Jupyter Notebooks are. So if you have never played with this, don't go to the <coughs> link at the very right, it's not for you. But if you're really deep into this already and you wanna see how we do the rag and the tagging and all that stuff, it's explained over there. And then at the bottom, if you wanna know about the sites itself, there's a Next.js front end of the Drupal as well, just for completeness sake, because um, yeah, it's actually three parts that work together. And yeah, we have 50 minutes for questions. Shoot, and we're happy to answer. All right, we start back there. Okay, good question. Do you have any projects you actually work with a government agency? Say again? Do you have any projects done with actual, the actual government agency? Um, so we do, as a hosting company, we host <coughs> government websites, yes. We have a project in Australia right now with the government where they're trying to do improve the search and um, for that specifically. Um, so very similar to what you just saw is to actually provide a citizen that they can go and say like, I need to renew the passport, what should I do? And it will return them a, question, a specific answer for that specifically, yes. Yes? You say you never store uh, the customer data, but isn't there an element to some models where you tune the system by comparing questions with answers? Yes. To improve its response? Yes. So today, there is two main ways how to train a model. One of them is what we so showed you, the RAG, or some people call it in context mm -hmm. training. Another one is called LoRa fine tuning, where you let a model read a lot of questions and answers, and it then also learns about your specific content. The problem is this is very expensive, takes a lot of time, and is more complex. And so what we're doing is we're trying always to solve the problems first with RAG, because the good thing is this can be done in real time. Like if you publish a new content, you can just put it in the vector database, like let's say a new recipe, and you can immediately answer about this. In fine tuning, it would take you hours or maybe days to retrain your model. You would spend thousands of dollars. But yes, there is a way to train your model in another way. But so far, what we have seen, it's not really necessary. Um, yeah, you wanna yeah uh, just to jump in on that, I mean, and to address the issue of privacy when you fine tune, there are, there are a lot of solutions that are coming out to obfuscate and basically change whatever data you use during the fine tuning process. So you basically are abstracting away any personal information while you're fine tuning. But it is a much more expensive, much more time consuming and difficult process to go through. Yes. So you said you're self hosting an LLM. So which model and what are you using for encoders? What are we using for? What, which encoder are you using? You mean the embeddings? Yeah. So it's it's kind of whatever you whatever can, yeah. is open source yeah. and has the correct licensing, we can we can host. Yeah. So uh, so what do you Lama see here? Two. Is Llama two? Yeah. It's Lama two. It's Lama two. Yeah. 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 But there is like in the last weeks there is a new <laughs> team called Mistral that came out. So yeah. we're playing with that one as well. Mm -hmm. It. It's part of the, of the testing that you actually test multiple models and maybe even multiple embedding systems. Yeah. Um, that is part of figuring out which model maybe works better. Because like, if I do something for recipes, I want a model that knows about overall about ingredients. Like it wants to know that an apple, what an apple is. If I have a model, or I, we have a customer right now that wants to read a lot of um, Python code, I maybe need, and then I use a model that maybe has specifically trained additionally for right. Python, like Lama. Facebook Meta released a, a coder Llama, which is Llama 2 trained on additional code on top of it. So it, it even understands even better computer code. And we believe in the future we're gonna have models trained into specific areas. Um, of course, also different languages and stuff like that. But our solution that we currently have you can pretty much run any model that you find and we can run for you. But this is an emerging space for sure where it's you know being able to swap out models, hot swap models uh, on demand and you know, the, the standardization over 
what frameworks are used to build the APIs to these models. A lot of the stuff we have right now is a combination of open source and some of our own customization, whereas I think in the future, you're gonna see a lot more standardization of the frameworks that are used to, to, to host these models. But it's it all, most of them are all built around the open AI um, API interface to how to work with an LLM at this point. Yeah, I, I have a question on your specific example of the recipes. Yeah. What happens if, for example, one of the recipes that comes up, I, just me, my believe in my website, don't think that one of those is actually Italian. It shouldn't be Italian, right? So I don't want that to come up. Um, is that part, is that something that I put in like the context of saying like, hey, don't consider this type of recipe Italian? And how does that scale? Because you know, if, I, if I'm just sure, adding sure. one thing, that's pretty easy. But if I'm starting to put in like different limitations like that for my specific example, how do I go? Like that's a great question. And I think this speaks to the, you know, there's, there's no silver bullet here. And I think that there's a couple of ways I could see solving that. I mean, the human in the loop might be one of those situations where you need some human to actually review what the LLM decides is Italian and whether or not it is. Now, if you can come up with a prompt iteration that addresses that concern, that say, hey, you know what, Mediterranean is a little bit too vague for Italian food, you know, try to be more specific, and maybe that would address it, but you'd have to figure that out through trial and error. But um, yeah, I would, I would say either a combination of prompt engineering and human in the loop review, you'd probably get 95% of the way there, if not further. You talk about having a vector database is like the part of how it, the, what the chatbot draws from. Is that something that is built during model development, or is that something that you can build on top of like Solar or Elasticsearch? You can pretty much use any vector databases. Okay. This yeah. one right now is an in in file database in JavaScript because it's it doesn't Chroma. really yeah. Chroma. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to store a lot of data. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, in the future, or let's say if you actually build this where you maybe have multiple chatbots accessing that same data, you want to use Elasticsearch that can store vectors. Postgres has vector databases. In the end, it just becomes another database like SQL, just instead of that you're asking it via columns and rows, you're asking it about vectors. Uh -huh. But it really does not matter which database you choose from. Or from. Right, and it also <coughs> speaks to the difference between um, unstructured data and structured data. Yeah. So if you have an existing MySQL database or you have an existing database, you can use that for RAG purposes sort of separate from your unstructured content. And so you, how you pull that information in, you might be doing SQL queries to your MySQL database. You might actually be having the LLM generate the SQL queries to your MySQL database and then pulling that information back in along with your unstructured content. So it's basically, you know, wild, wild west, how you want to go out and grab whatever content you want to stuff into your prompt. It's, it's whatever makes sense for your application. Um, so we were just trying to similar things, but I'm just wondering, like, uh, the cost effective. So if you just, we have, a, like, as you mentioned, like, smaller, smaller the model, could you ask, like, uh, uh, approximately how much you pay for every month? to run that module in the hosting, I mean, we are using the AWS, but yes. So in all of this, the, ex <coughs> the expensive part is over here. Okay. It's the language yeah, model. Yeah. That chatbot in the vector database is just a JavaScript container that just runs. Like, that is cheap. The problem is the LLM, and the problem is specifically, we run a model, right now it's like a seven billion parameter model, and if you wanna, if you wanna get answers fast, mm -hmm. meaning within a couple of seconds, you need to run them on top of GPUs. Okay. And right now, a seven billion model costs you, if you run the GPU 24 seven, okay. it costs you at least $2,000 a day to per, per, per month. month. Per month, correct. But there's a lot of optimizations you can do. A, you can scale down the, 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 the GPU if you don't use it. Caching. So you can do some caching, or what we're looking into, that we actually share this across customers. Like, if you come to us today and ask for a database, I'm not actually starting an RDS database just for you at AWS. I'm giving you access to an existing one, so you can put your data in there. Mm -hmm. With the language models, we could technically do exactly the same, where we run the, lang the models for you, and just when you ask it a question, then we charge you 
for the amount of time or maybe the amount of tokens that you asked it, but we can still make sure that it's running in AWS in the US or in whatever you tell us that it's running. So that's something that we are as a hosting company looking to what do the customers need? Today, we run them um, on a GPO by itself, but we can scale them up and down based on the usage. So if you don't have anybody that uses it over the weekend, you can shut it down, for example. So I would say $2,000, but that highly depends. So let's maybe talk and find out more what you want. So, yes. I just wanted to know if it'd be possible to get a copy of the slides. Yes. Um, Come later to me, and I will give you a, a QR code of the slides. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, yes, back there. Did you use the LLM to generate the tag categories themselves? Yes. And yep. how sensitive is the rag to when you have ten or ten thousand categories, tag categories? You mean if it's possible, or if it because we tell it specifically. You can show it here. So we tell it down here that we want a category, a type, unique ingredients, preparation, cultural origin, occasion, <coughs> special features. Even the human told it those yes. were the categories. Yes. So you didn't use the LLM to do it so. No, 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 this is an example. We told the LLM an example of what we wanted the LLM to generate. The LLM will then go in and take that example it's, that's yeah, so like, it's almost a few shot example yeah. at that point, but it's actually just a single example where we just, then the LLM takes that example and fills it in with what it thinks are the actual tags and categories based on the, the recipe itself. Yeah, so the example, for example, says category drink. What it came back with was category food. We told it type vegan, and it came back with type meat-based. Yeah. I never told it food or meat-based. All we told it is category and type. And the stuff and the actual values of these attributes, the LLM came up by itself. And it comes up with that based on human language. Like it's not that it randomly picks one, it obviously knows that smoked pears is a unique ingredient because it has not seen many recipes of that. So it knows smoked pears is a special thing. What's important to, to reference when, when talking about this is looking at that initial instructions and looking at the rules beyond that example because the instructions tell the LLM what to do with that output example, if that makes any sense. So it basically describes to the LLM that, look, I want to replace this output example with what you figure out based on the recipe that we send you, if that makes sense. Yes. Going back to a few questions ago where <coughs> one of the proposed solutions you had was a human in a loop. Mm. So is it possible for the LLM to like recursively iterate on its context window that you originally provided with? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. And so that's actually where we think the really cool stuff comes back. Yeah. So you could ask, let's say you could ask multiple models the answers and then have a, a final model that looks at all the answers of them and combines them again. Like there's there's endless capabilities that you can connect. Like what we see here that we pre we do one call to the LLM. You could do multiple calls yeah. to the LLM and get even more data yeah. and things like that. And some of our other apps that we're working on, we introduce agents, which agents actually go off and do multiple things, chains of tasks in a row and then come back to a human for actually input and feedback, and then go off and do another whole set of tasks. So yeah, it's really up to your imagination how you can leverage a lot of these LLMs. Anybody else? Yes. So just a question about this diagram. The vector database, is that the, are those the feature vectors used by the chatbot, or is it something else? That's, that's the feature vectors okay. by the chatbot. Yeah. So for, you mentioned that it's a fast-moving field. Um, I wanted to pro provide a couple of things in context. I was at uh, AI Dev World in Santa Clara last week. Um, number one, the tiny MCE people, the WYSIWYG editor people, gave a talk that was essentially what you just told. Mm. Literally the same thing, just applied to what they're busy with. Um, also, I talked to at least half a dozen people that said, if you want to do sort of your own thing, Vector database is where you're going to go. It seems like Merslo is coalescing, so it, it reinforced a lot of my own thinking of that this is the right path to go. So, just wanted to provide that. It's 
Thank you. I think this will lead us yeah. better into the future. And, and I actually have to say, like, after we realized this, we always thought this is going to be where the innovation happens. We literally just take a pre-trained model from Facebook, start it running. The actual innovation happens in here, in how you store the data, the prompt engineering, and all that stuff. So that's really where the magic happens, is over here. The LLM, honestly, is very dumb. It's just really good in answering questions, but you need to provide it all the context and everything to actually be able to answer the questions, and that comes from over here. All right. I think we're at time, but one more? So how do you find you the LLM to know about your site recipe? Uh, yes, it is. No, it's all through a vector database and injected at question time. There's no fine tuning happening at all here. All right, if you have more questions, come over here. We're happy to answer them. Thank you.